Good afternoon and welcome back to the Sohn Lecture Series, and in particular to the last talk in the series. We've so enjoyed having you with us this year for um, a, a sort of unexpected journey through the pandemic and a series of online events that were a first for us. But it's been very rewarding, uh, both intellectually to be in dialogue with you and to see the numbers grow week after week as more and more people engaged with our events. So thank you for being with us this year. I'll give just a couple of housekeeping notes as usual. Um, we've just pasted some text in the chat Check that out at the end of the talk. And in the midst of the talk, please feel free to enter questions that you develop in the Q&A box. There will be a brief Q&A at the end. And while we won't be able to address every question, we'll certainly try to get to as many of them as possible. Today, we have a very special speaker whom I've been privileged to work with over the last year. And to introduce him, we have another very special person, the chairman of the Sohn Foundation, Paul Whelan. Paul? Thank you, Michael. And good afternoon, everybody. We have uh, taken you all on, uh, in a way, a tour around the world this year with our series of lectures on the idea of color and light. And it's exciting, though, that for our grand finale tonight, we're coming home to the museum for a lecture by the director of that museum, Bruce Boucher. Uh, I do want to thank our, our, our wonderful uh, trustees and also our program committee led by Jonathan Hogg uh, for uh, allowing us to be here today, for bringing us together. Uh, Bruce has been a great ally of the foundation as we work to support this uniquely complex 19th century masterpiece. Today, Bruce will be sharing his thoughts on just one of the stories at the museum that of Sir John Sohn's architecture and the rendering of that architecture, which was mostly carried out by the painter and architect Joseph Gandhi. Bruce is an art historian and curator specializing in Renaissance and Baroque sculpture and architecture. He is Professor Emeritus at University College London, where he taught for over 20 years and has published a number of books. Before joining the Sohn, Bruce was director of the Fralin Museum of Art at the University of Virginia, which, was followed at, uh, which followed a role as curator and head of European sculpture, decorative arts, and ancient art at the Art Institute of Chicago. He is former president of the board of the Center for, Plan for Palladian Studies in America and is currently a fellow for the Society of Antiquaries. Bruce became director of the Sound in May 2016 and has since spearheaded the completion of the Opening Up the Sound campaign of major renovations and has reinvented the way that the museum interacts with the public and with the art and architecture communities. Welcome, Bruce. We're, well, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, uh, Paul and uh, Michael. It's great to be uh, with you both and also to be uh, with um, the patrons of uh, Sir John Soane's Museum Foundation, which is a great ally of the uh, museum. And I'm glad uh, to give you, bring you greetings from the museum where I am at the moment, uh, and also from a rather uh, chilly uh, spring afternoon in London. Hmm. Okay, let's see now. Hmm. All right. Okay, there we go. Oops, nope, we've gone backwards. Yeah. Right. Well, in this uh, lecture series, uh, as I was thinking about what to talk about, um, I became fascinated by the relationship between uh, Joseph Michael Gandhi and uh, John Soane. And it made me think about what it was in my early encounters with Sohn that really stood out for me. And I think it was going to the Dulwich Picture Gallery in the 1970s when I was a uh, graduate student at the Courtauld Institute. And it was both the idiosyncratic uh, rendering of the exterior of the building and the brilliant sequence of uh, top lit galleries that um, led me uh, quite unexpectedly 
to the mausoleum. Let's see if I can. Hmm. That's interesting. Ah, okay, sorry. I think maybe I didn't. Um... I think you have it now, Bruce. Um, just yes, I'm, I'm just trying to go backwards. <laughs> Oh, I see. Okay, I can go back that way. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Down again the next time you start. Sorry, what? You'll just need to, to press down on your cursor the next time, and then you'll be clicked in. Okay, fine. As I said, um, coming to the uh, Dulwich Picture Gallery, I was unprepared for the mausoleum, which is set in the middle of the building. As many of you know, you'll go down three steps, into a chamber where you encounter the sarcophagi of the founders of the gallery. And you experience an immediate change of atmosphere, which is created by the yellow glass of the lantern. So here seems to anticipate the work of a light sculptor like James Turrell. And of course, one finds similar effects in number 13, Lincoln's Inn Field. The frisson caused by Soane's use of color was acknowledged by his contemporaries. Yeah. I can advance the slides for you, Bruce. So just let me know when. Uh, okay, that, that's no, that's fine. Thank you. I will. I'll, I'll have a go, and if, if not, I'll come back to you <laughs> for help. Um, in the privately printed 1835 description of the house and museum, Soane's friend and collaborator, the novelist Barbara Hoffman, waxed lyrical over the use of amber glass to light the Apollo Belvedere in the dome area, which we're looking at now. The beauty of this fine statue, she wrote, is considerably enhanced by that distribution of light and color, which often from undiscovered sources sheds the most exquisite hues and produces the most magical effects throughout the museum, thereby communicating the only charm in which an assemblage of marbles must be deficient. So John Soane, she continues, has thus brought painting so far as it is color to embellish architecture and sculpture. As my colleague Helen Dory observed in an earlier talk in this series, Soane's handling of colored and stained glass reflected an aesthetic that runs through his house as well as his architecture in general. Of course, this was part of what Germans would call the Zeitstil of Soane's time. And one can find similar creations in the works of Augustus Pugin, James Wyatt, and Soane's friend and fellow academician, Turner. There we go. Um, who illustrated his lectures on perspective at the Royal Academy with atmospheric depictions of interiors, such as this one, uh, Wyatt's, James Wyatt's, James Wyatt's Brocklesby Mausoleum, with its own particular Lumiere Mysterieuse. In his lectures, Soane comments upon the poverty of Protestant churches as opposed to their Italian counterparts. Nothing can exceed, he writes, the magnificence and richness of the Italian churches in painting, sculpture, and architecture, whilst the simplicity of our religion will not admit a single picture within its walls, and the expensive materials and labor almost preclude the columns. I've often thought that Soane compensated for this poverty of effect by transposing the sacred to the secular context. And here, of course, we're looking at uh, a view of the monk's parlor um, shortly after it was completed in 1825 with uh, this two-story uh, effect with the light filtering through uh, the yellow uh, colored glass uh, in the skylight and creating an effect similar to the kind of effect that Soane responded to in, uh, in Gothic architecture. Certainly, attentive contemporaries like the German-born French architect Jacques Ignace Hittorf wrote enthusiastically about Soane's achievements in the Bank of England, which Hittorf saw as demonstrating the talent and judgment of the architect. Oops, sorry. How did that happen? 
Uh, among other things, Hittorf noted that the eye and spirit are struck by the ingenious combination in the distribution of light. The effect of this and of the perspective calculated for each area represented the ability of architecture to achieve marvel marvelous effects. And this view of the bank's rotunda from 1798, the Bank of England's rotunda, has been endowed with the monumentality and dramatic lighting that are exaggerated. Yet it conveys something of that calculated distribution of light observed by Hittorf. The artist who rendered this interior had only just join, joined Soane's office that year. And lest I be accused of bearing the lead, let me now introduce the man in question, Joseph Michael Gandhi, and explain how his collaboration with John Soane came about. Soane and Gandhi are a fascinating pair, sharing a melancholic frame of mind and a morbid fascination with what Horace Walpole called Glumth. Born in 1771, Gandhi was a generation younger than Soane and likewise came of modest stock. His father was a butler at White's, one of the ex exclusive gaming clubs in the West End of London. And the younger Gandhi's ability as a draftsman was encouraged by his father's employer. And he became a pupil of the fashionable architect, James Wyatt. Like Soane, Gandhi followed the same pattern of study going to the Royal Academy schools where he enrolled in 1789. And again, like Soane, he won a gold medal for the design of a triumphal art and excelled in perspective drawings. With the encouragement of Wyatt, Gandhi went to Rome in 1794, also with the financial backing of his father's employer. His period of study there ended abruptly in 1797 after the city was sacked by Napoleon's army. And it was one of Gandhi's many misfortunes to return to London at a time when architectural employment had virtually dried up because of the Anglo-French wars of the 1790s that spilled over into the first decade of the 1800s. Nevertheless, his talent as a draftsman gained him employment with Soane. And although he only stayed with Soane for three years, he remained on call to capture his former master's designs on paper. And it's easy to see why. For example, this study of the library of Viscount Bridport's house, Cricket Lodge in Somerset, is a striking example, or a striking exercise, I should say, in how sunlight illuminates a room and its contents, in this case, through the last rays of the setting sun. However, Gandhi never went to Cricket Lodge and was relying upon Soane's verbal accounts and other sketches. There is something uncanny about Gandhi's ability to convey the effect of light and his view of a sepulchral chapel proposed for another of Soane's houses, the Tyringham in Buckinghamshire, is sim similarly arresting both as a nocturnal landscape and for the way in which the features of the building appear to be lit by an internal yellow light. Gandhi retained a lifelong interest in observing atmospheric conditions. The Soane Museum now has an album of drawings dating from the 1820s in which studies of clouds and sky abound, similar to the more dazzling studies in this vein by John Constable. And what you see here is um, not only is it a study of clouds and an, an inverted um, rainbow, uh, but he gives the date, uh, March the 3rd, 1827, nine o'clock in the morning and describes what he's seeing. And, uh, there's a, a whole album of these, which uh, was acquired by the Soane Museum at the beginning of the 2000s. To understand Gandhi, one should bear in mind that he was part of a contemporary trend that was described by his teacher in perspective at the Royal Academy, Edward Edwards, as poetic or composite landscapes, which were recommended as an exercise for architects and for topographers. Such works grew out of the recognition that conventional architectural draftsmanship, like this drawing by William Chambers and Laurent Péchu for the Fountain of Trevi in Rome, were primarily addressed to professionals and connoisseurs of the genre rather than to the general public. Indeed, an anonymous critic of an early Royal Academy exhibition in 1776 advocated that 
and I quote, the best architectural designs should be expressed somewhat gracefully, and especially when exhibited to public view. Otherwise, they cannot among paintings be introduced with propriety. There was a movement in the latter half of the 18th century to turn architectural renderings into landscapes so that they would hold their own against the competition of historical and mythological paintings. James Wyatt, under whom Gandhi first trained, availed himself of artists of the caliber of Turner in a work like this projected design for Fontill Abbey. Gandhi made this genre his own and uh, exhibited 113 works of this kind at the Royal Academy between 1789 and 1838. And I should say that uh, in the catalog of 1798 of the Royal Academy exhibition, uh, the name of Turner didn't appear, but Wyatt relied upon him and Turner did similar studies for other architects. And interestingly enough, towards the end of his life, Turner, is said to have uh, remarked that if he had it to do over again, he would have preferred to be an architect. The majority of the 113 works submi submitted to the Royal Academy for exhibition were watercolors, often of imaginary compositions or literary ones, such as this sepulchral chamber from 1800, where again, you have this uncanny uh, light that seems to illuminate uh, this dark uh, ancient chamber. Or perhaps his tour de force, Merlin's tomb of 1815, a work which was very much admired and uh, was given by Gandhi to uh, another Royal Academician, uh, the sculptor Richard Westmacott. It was works like these that Sir John Summerson had in mind when he characterized Gandhi as more at home in a cave, which comes constantly into his drawings, where, however, it is mysteriously illuminated or opens out into the sunshine. And one can imagine here that uh, this watercolor would convey something of the effect that Soane sought when he illuminated the tomb of Seti I, the sarcophagus that he acquired in 1824 in his famous sarcophagus parties of uh, 1825. Still, such was the forcefulness of Gandhi's works that he was elected an Associate Royal Academician in 1808 1803, even though he had not built a single building. Often in reviews of uh, Royal Academy exhibitions of the early 1800s, there were comments on architecture to the effect that there was little of note if we accept some models of Gandhi of imaginary buildings, or a common refrain about the architectural designs ran along the lines of little of originality independent of Gandhi. But where did this style come from? Like Soane, Gandhi was deeply influenced by the work of Piranesi. Here we see um, a Piranesi, which is in the uh, Capriccio, which is in the Soane Museum. Uh, it was given by Piranesi to Robert Adam uh, and influenced a number of similar works by Adam. And it was acquired uh, by Soane in 1818 with uh, numerous other uh, works by Adam and in Adam's possession. So Piranesi was very important both for Soane and for uh, Gandhi for this fantastical architecture, the uh, use of chiaroscuro dramatic lighting. Um, another important role model for um, Gandhi was Gianpaolo Panini. Um, here we're looking at um, the type of painting that Panini excelled at, which was um, imaginary galleries of uh, paintings, or in this case of architecture views of the uh, antiquities of, of Rome. And as we'll see, this kind of uh, painting uh, had an influence on both Soane and Gandhi in terms of the display of Gandhi's works in Soane's house. Another important uh, source was 
Charles-Louis Clérisseau, who was a, a French art, artist architect who was active in Rome from the, uh, in the third quarter of the 18th century, um, collaborated with people like uh, Thomas Jefferson, taught drawing to Robert Adam and others, and was noted for his um, depictions of the Roman ruins, such as this one of the Forum of Nerva, which is again from the Soane collection, or, and also from more imaginative uh, Capricci. And another strand in his work can be seen in uh, stagecraft, uh, the work of an architect like, sorry, we've, an architect like Louis-Jean Desprez, um, who was both an architect and stage designer at the Swedish court in the uh, 1790s. There was also more than a dash of what the French architect and theoretician uh, Jacques-Francois Blondel termed architecture terrible, that is architecture that was um, awesome, that uh, dealt with heavy subjects like prisons, uh, and a great exponent of this kind of uh, impactful architecture, if you will, was the uh, painter John Martin, who was a contemporary of Soane's and Gandhi's, and uh, this etching, uh, which is based upon a large canvas by Martin called The Fall of Babylon, um, the original painting uh, caused a stir at the British institution when it was exhibited in 1819. People queued for hours to uh, see it and Stone went to see it several times. And this mezzotint, which was produced by uh, Martin uh, many years later, has an inscription to Stone uh, thanking him for coming and for his uh, encouragement. So like Piranesi and Stone, Gandhi believed in what he called the manipulation of material from a range of sources. Later in his career, he wrote approvingly that the beauties of every clime and age may be selected by modern art with taste, judgment, and poetical conception, a position with which both Piranesi and Sohn sympathized. But not everyone was charmed by his efforts, and Gandhi never became a full Royal Academician despite being nominated six times. Some critics like George Stantz thought he was a mere draftsman enthralled to stage design, but Sohn saw in him um, a perfect vehicle for presenting his works to the public. Even so, Sohn characteristically gave Gandhi a backhanded compliment in his fifth lecture, fifth of his Royal Academy lectures, when he wrote, a superior manner of drawing is absolutely necessary. Indeed, it is impossible not to admire the beauties and almost magical effects in the architectural drawings of a Clarisseau, a Gandhi, or a Turner. But he added, few architects can hope to reach the excellency of these artists without devoting to drawing too much of that time they ought to employ in the attainment of higher and more essential qualifications of an architect. Nonetheless, Sohn employed Gandhi consistently after his brief stint in his office in Lincoln's Inn Field, and it's a moot point how much Sohn's architectural style was influenced by Gandhi or vice versa. In any case, Gandhi understood implicitly the line of direction that Sohn was uh, following, as these two nocturnal views of the dome area suggest. In particular, the one on the right draws upon a Piranesian vision of antiquity and reminiscences of the custom of visiting Roman uh, catacombs and monuments by night that both men had experienced in their student years. And both of these are focused on the, the dome area. Um, the one on the right is, is probably the more famous of the two uh, and shows this really Piranesian compilation of uh, casts of antiquities. Um, such as the Temple of Castor and Pollux uh, in Rome, um, looked at from the bottom of, from the, the crypt below the, the dome area in, in 1813. Gandhi was also willing to, a willing accomplice in Soane's fantasy architecture, 
something that became more insistent as the years went by. A good example of this is this 1813 study for an expansion of the facade of number 13, Lincoln's Inn Field, to include numbers 14 and 15, uh, thus creating a focal point on the north side of the square. It was a project destined to remain fixed on, the, uh, on paper, as Soane had no hope of acquiring the adjacent properties. Yet the watercolor was exhibited in 1813 at the Royal Academy, and Soane paid Gandhi the substantial sum of 50 pounds for his labor. This was approximately the amount that Soane gave Turner for a watercolor of similar dimensions in 1804. And what you can see here, which is um, so uh, bizarre in a way, is uh, the facade of number 13, which is then replicated across to number 15. And you can probably discern up here the um, figures of John and Eliza Soane waving from uh, the balcony, which was originally an open arcade and, and only later um, uh, gla glazed in. Works like this one um, were destined, as I said, to be seen at the Royal Academy. So therefore, they were very important to Soane because they'd be seen by several thousand people it was one of the best places that you could uh, display your work either as a painter or a sculptor or an architect. So they were very central to Soane's image of himself, the public image of Soane's art, as well as an advertisement for future commissions. But there was also a personal bond between the two men. Soane championed Gandhi and could see that the younger man was struggling. They both nurtured a sense of grievance against the world and their critics. Soane often let, lent Gandhi or Mrs. Gandhi sums of money that were never repaid, especially when Gandhi was imprisoned for debt, which occurred twice. Thus, it's not surprising to find that the cynosure of Soane's art collection, the picture room, would feature a wall of Soane and Gandhi. The south side of the gallery, which we're seeing here, opens onto a sequence of planes that feature the unusual combined efforts of the two men. In format, they resemble a polyptych celebrating works by Soane, both built and unbuilt. And not unlike paintings by Panini the, that both men admired. Taken together, the images illustrate Soane's obsessive preoccupation with his status among contemporaries and rivals. With these works, Gandhi elevated architectural watercolors to the level of historical landscape painting. And this made him the perfect exponent of Soane's ideas about architectural presentation and what Soane called the poetry of architecture. The earliest of these works inside the picture plane are architectural visions of uh, early fancy in the gay morning of youth and dreams in the evening of life, a, a title, a poetic title uh, that Soane gave this when it was exhibited in 1820. And public and private buildings executed by Sir John Soane between 1780 and 1815, eight, yeah, 1815, which was exhibited in 1818 at the Royal Academy. These two works are juxtaposed on the outer panels of the three planes. And there's a pervasive sense of melancholy conveyed by that arrangement. In both editions of the description of the residence of John Soane architect, which was published privately in his lifetime, Soane calls attention to the relationship between the two works, glossing architectural visions, this one, as the wild effusions of a mind glowing with ardent and enthusiastic desire to attain professional distinction. It must be said that architectural visions uh, is less interesting than the other large watercolors, since it's essentially a tribute to the kind of academic exercise demanded of, a, of student competitions in Soane's youth. You can see here the uh, triumphal bridge on the far left, which won him the gold medal in 1776, uh, uh, the uh, triumphal arch, which was another work that won Soane a prize. Uh, above that, a new house of lords, which again was an academic exercise. 
Above that here, the monument, a monument, uh, national monument to the French wars, which Soane hoped would be erected and filled with uh, sculpture celebrating um, Nelson and other uh, heroes of the uh, British Army and uh, Navy. And it culminates up above in a series of churches and sepulchres at the summit of the hill. There's a funeral procession to the upper left, uh, which was identified by Soane as that of the immortal Nelson. Contemporary opinion was divided over the merits of this work. One viewer, one reviewer judged it as a grand poetical composition of the best of Mr. Soane's designs, while another dismissed it as chimerical groups of porticos and temples huddled together without any point of practical design. Public and Private Buildings, uh, the other work, is a more arresting one, and a comparison of this preliminary sketch with the finished watercolor suggests the kind of exchanges that must have occurred between Soane and Gandhi as they uh, discuss the genesis of this work. The sketch shows a similar disposition to the finished work. You have three-dimensional models around the size, sides of the room, and on the walls are framed images of the Bank of England, all under a Sonian saucer dome. Uh, and in the background, you have caryatids uh, supporting the uh, dome rather than the finished Ionic order uh, in the final work. Each image of the bank on the wall is carefully labeled, but there also is a space for private commissions scattered here and there. The um, facade of uh, Tiringham and the gate lodge at the same uh, estate, uh, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, number 13, Lincoln's in Fields, and Eliza Soane's tomb. Dramatically illuminated by a powerful studio lamp, the finished version invests the models with a monumentality and introduces a table in the lower right-hand corner with John Soane himself at work, generating further plans and as well with a three-dimensional model of the Bank of England, which you can see here. And you can see how um, the models in the background, this is Tiringham and this is the uh, gate uh, to uh, Tiringham, uh, really uh, dwarf the figure of Soane, uh, really amplifying the importance of uh, these works. It's an extraordinary, uh, creation uh, indebted to uh, Panini and indeed somewhat later in the second half of the 1820s, uh, Soane and Gandhi concocted a riff on this theme of a Soane re retrospective exhibition. The setting is based upon an extended, expanded version of the picture room, which had just been finished in 1825 with its distinctive clerestory lighting and ceiling of arched canopies, as some uh, call this mixture of classical and um, English Gothic. You can see um, three-dimensional models of the Bank of England here, uh, the tomb of Liza Soane, some of churches, uh, some of his uh, church models here, and the um, paintings around the wall represent a mixture of public and private commissions, much as in the earlier watercolor that we were just looking at from 1818. Taken together, these uh, watercolors point out a gap between Soane's ambition and the actuality of his state commissions. For with the exception of the Bank of England, uh, many of them eluded him. To be sure, the Bank of England is present in the picture room. Um, and here is uh, one particular version by Gandhi, which was again exhibited at the Royal Academy, showing different views of the courtyards, the different chambers of the room, the kind of ingenious variety that uh, Jacques Ignace Hittorf uh, commented upon in his report on the museum and, and so on as an architect from, that he Create, uh, wrote in 1836. But 
what stands out are the prize commissions that did not happen. The Royal Palace. This one, in fact, is based upon an academic exercise of 1779 inspired by Vignola's Caprarola and then rendered again in a more uh, sophisticated way by Gandhi in 1828 for exhibit at the Royal Academy. Um, there was a triumphal entry into Downing Street, which again uh, never happened. Uh, a state entrance into London from uh, Kensington. Oops, sorry. Yes, which um, all of these works um, in their paper form here represent what um, Brian Lukacher has aptly termed a sort of alternative history of contemporary architecture if John Soane had been given the major commissions that went to John Nash. Soane would return to this theme again and again in his privately printed designs for public and private buildings of 1832, where the projects are laid out to follow a ceremonial route of the sovereign from Windsor Castle to Westminster Abbey and the House of Lords. He characterized, for instance, this gate at the entrance to London as combining the classical simplicity of Grecian architecture, the magnificence of the Roman architecture and the fanciful intricacy and playful effects of the Gothic architecture. In Gandhi's rendering, as you can see here, the plan and details of the structure are included in the foreground, as well as picturesque details such as the soldiers lining up to receive the sovereign as he uh, symbolically enters the uh, London. And it's again characteristic of something that one finds uh, in both Soane and Gandhi, this idea of mixing different periods of architecture together to create one uh, cohesive whole. In Gandhi's rendering, um, they are um, beautiful works, but um, that many critics still uh, damn them with faint praise. One critic, in fact, saying of this drawing that it was a marvelous drawing, but a rotten design. Soane, however, was undaunted by such criticism and continued to occupy himself with um, these designs, uh, even inserting a lengthy analysis of them into his Royal Academy lectures in 1832 and 1834, as well as in uh, his printed publications of 1832 and the description of his house and museum in 1835. Gandhi also created similar works, royal projects in his own name, such as this fantastical project for a triumphal entry to a palace of 1826, in which he pulls out all the stops to create something that anticipates the second empire in France. And again, what you can see here, I hope, is that you've got a combination of Greek Ionic orders here with a little uh, rotunda here that has essentially Gothic uh, carvings that are inspired by the chapel of Roslyn in uh, Midlothian in Scotland, a famous 15th century chapel whose elaborate decoration was uh, the subject of uh, much curious um, antiquarian study and of course was made famous by Sir Walter Scott in The Lay of the Last Minstrel. So again, Gandhi, like Soane, is merging these to create something which um, would have been, I think, remarkably uh, implausible uh, to uh, create. It would have required an army of masons and sculptors uh, to work over a life lifetime. And again, Brian Lukacher, who's written so perceptively about Gandhi, describes these projects by Soane and Gandhi as hypothetical palaces, not really designed for the king, but more in the place of the king. That is to say, George IV, who in the latter years of his reign became largely invisible. By the same token, Gandhi's frequent recreations of the classical world, which he submitted to uh, the Royal Academy, such as this uh, landing to place to a temple, were um, have been characterized as creating a modern, if unspoken parallel with post-Waterloo Britain, where relatively few great buildings were actually 
built. And the common um, complaint of both Soane and Gandhi was the, the meanness of much uh, public architecture of the time. Uh, notably, something like the um, Bucking, facade of Buckingham Palace by John Nash, um, which uh, Soan condemned in his lectures as a most heterogeneous work. And I think both Soane and Gandhi envied uh, France under Napoleon because of the great, the grand projet, uh, which decorated, which embellished the city. And there was nothing like that in um, London of the Regency or the um, 1820s or 1830s. In effect, Gandhi became Soane's alter ego and his watercolors are scattered throughout this house like souvenirs of past time. The artist C.R. Les Leslie, who uh, was a contemporary and of, of Gandhi's and, and knew him well, throws an interesting light on this collaboration between the two men in the 1820s. Gandhi, he wrote, was much employed by Soane in making drawings. And I remember an exhibition at Somerset House in which the architectural room was made, what is rarely the case, as attractive as any other by his drawings alone, though his name was not in the catalog. There were a series of magnificent designs to which Sir John Soane's name was attached, though Soane was then entirely blind. How far they were suggested by to him, to Gandhi, by him, it is impossible to say. But it may be doubted whether anything exhibited by Soane before his blindness equaled them. I suspect Leslie had in mind works like this one, the uh, evening view of the Freemasons Hall in 1831, um, with its uh, dome seemingly suspended like a canopy above the room with its spectral lighting and uh, from both the dome and also from the lamps that Sohn uh, designed for the building itself. Um, or something like the law courts, which Sohn was uh, at work on in Westminster uh, in the 1820s. In this case, we're looking at the Court of Chancery. One has to wonder whether uh, this building um, or this court was quite as dramatic as uh, the image Gandhi has given us, because one of the contemporary criticism of Soane's law courts was that they were dark. But in Gandhi's hands, the top-lit chambers became a visual metaphor for divine guidance on the machinery of justice. But probably the most extraordinary of these exhibited watercolors are the two that sh were shown at the Royal Academy successively in 1830 and 1832. A bird's eye view of England, which we see here, and architectural ruins of vision. Although not displayed together now, they share the same desolate atmosphere by juxtaposing the architect's dream projects and his executed works. Of the two, architectural ruins was carried out by Gandhi in 1798, the same date as the view of the rotunda, which we see here on the upper right and which we looked at earlier uh, in the um, talk. Um, so it was, finished in 1798, but only exhibited in 1832, three decades later. And the two appear to have been, the, the two vi vi views of the rotunda appear to have been uh, companion pieces. Architectural ruins, this one, mirrors the then fashionable preoccupation with transients and ruins that exerted a morbid fascination for both Sohn and Gandhi. And it's interesting to recall that in 1796, the French artist Hubert Robert painted two views of the Grand Gallery of the Louvre, one as an art gallery and the other as a ruin. A preliminary sketch by Gandhi of the rotunda in ruins gives clearer evidence that the image is descended from Piranese's and Clarisseau's uh, Capricci, uh, both actual and artificial views of, of ruins. And there may also be an echo here of the Scottish aesthetician, Henry Hume, Lord Keynes, who made a celebrated distinction between the effect upon the spectator of classical 
ruins versus Gothic ruins. Gothic ruins, Keynes argued, demonstrated the triumph of time over strength, a melancholy but not unpleasant thought, while classical ruins suggested the triumph of barbarity over taste, a gloomy and discouraging thought. And here I'm showing uh, the Sloan's nightmare uh, come true. This was the demolition of that very room, the rotunda, in the 1920s when Sloan's interiors were raised so that uh, a 10 story building could be erected within the walls which uh, still survive and define the perimeter of the Bank of England. So, in a sense, the triumph of barbarism over taste um, did happen. Viewed through this lens, both the bird's eye view and the architectural ruins were probably executed as part of Soane's pessimistic leave taking from the bank just prior to his retirement in 1833. This work, uh, the bird's eye view, fuses plan section and elevation in a manner that hovers between a model of Soane's achievement and the illusion of a ruin. While the latter, the one we were just looking at, the architectural ruins, uh, is in fact a ruin and was accompanied in the catalog of the exhibition by Prospero's lines from the Tempest, which soon added to the catalog, the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. In his discussion, of the bird's eye view, Daniel Abramson put it well when he described this combination as a combination of plan, section, and elevation. The totality of Stone's achievement is represented, interior and exterior, construction and decoration, substructure and superstructure, all publicly revealed like a model on a tabletop. Indeed, I like to think that Gandhi based his work upon the plastic model of the bank seen on the table in the earlier architectural composition of 1818. It pays tribute to the breadth of Soane's inventiveness in terms of sweep and spatial complexity. But it's interesting that Soane, sorry, let's go back. Um, it's interesting that in Soane's catalog entry for this, ex this work in the Royal Academy exhibition, he quotes a passage from a French novel in which the devil lifts the roof on a superb edifice national so that its interior is revealed like a pie with its crust removed. It's a sardonic deflating comment consonant with Soane's capacity for self-tormenting gloom. It also expresses the vanity of human wishes with its image of uh, the, the vanity of human issues um, amid the ruins of a once superb edifice national. Although in fact, it's not really, of course, this is not a ruin because it, everything is neat as a pin. It simply can, hovers between the idea of something like the Baths of Caracalla and uh, a, an axonometric uh, view of the variety of uh, interiors in the Bank of England. Gandhi continued to submit works to the Royal Academy for exhibition down to 1838. Some of them like this one on the left, illustrating comparative architectural styles melded into three different buildings, reflected an interest shared with Soane in trying to find the links between art and architecture across the globe. And I'm not sure whether you can see this so distinctly, but you have uh, a sort of prehistoric architecture down here. So, oh dear, let's get back to this one. Uh, prehistoric architecture and then Egyptian architecture above that, Greek architecture, Roman architecture and Gothic. Uh, you've taken control, I think. <laughs> There we are, Gothic architecture um, at the top and then Turkish architecture on the right. And uh, again, a variety of different kinds of architectures on the left-hand side. It's an idea that um, 
Soane expressed much more succinctly in his uh, pasticcio, which we see in the Gandhi uh, illustration, watercolor on the right, whereby he took a capital that he thought was, uh, was Hindu and put on top of it a copy of a Roman capital and then a finial uh, above that to indicate um, a kind of be his belief that there was a common currency among the architectures of the ancient world, as indeed there was a common theme in, in ancient religions. Unfortunately for Gandhi, uh, reviewers grew bored with his later works, dubbing them monstrous sublimities, and his active career came to an end in 1838. He died in, a, in an asylum five years later, essentially destitute. The mixed style of architectural rendering that he made his own also fell out of favor, and so successor as professor of architecture at the Royal Academy, C.R. Cockrell, must have had Gandhi in mind when he said such works had little to do with the real ends of our science. Pictorial effect takes the place of form, proportion, and design. Still, it is thanks to Gandhi that we have so much of Soane's work living on and probably enhanced by the cross-fertilization of these two minds, architects who, to paraphrase Joshua Reynolds on Sir John Banborough, composed like a painter. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That was a, what a wonderful journey you took us on. Um, we will uh, go into some some uh, questions and answers that have been posted, but I, I just wanted to ask you a question or two. Um, I have to say, I mean, having known about Sohn and Gandhi, I've ever, you've shown me so many things that I was completely unaware of, uh, and especially some of the the renderings that you showed of of Gandhi is like the that the one you showed right at the very end where he shows the uh, the comparative architectural styles is so over the top and in my mind sort of presages sort of what happened to architecture in the late 19th century and almost mm. the reason modernism had to be invented because if, if things got so crazy <laughs> and it reminds me of buildings in New York that were built by developers in the late 19th century where they many pieces were uh, were really purchased out of catalogs or moldings were purchased out of catalogs and different styles were blended together in a very casual way. And it sort of showed what happens or what could happen when in less capable hands, uh, different styles get mixed together. It's, I think you have to be uh, a genius like Sohn to be able to pull it off. Um, well, th th that's a very good point. It's Sohn uh, and Gandhi were really at the beginning of uh, historicism. Uh, they were aware of these different architectural styles, although Soane, particularly his approach to the Gothic was rather critical. He didn't think that the Gothic was appropriate for contemporary architecture, but what he liked was the effect that the Gothic, going into a Gothic cathedral uh, or a Gothic church had on him or had on people, this idea of creating mood journeys. And um, I think Gandhi was also uh, very much taken with that. Um, they both absorb, uh, absorbed by the, um, you might say, the sort of darker side of their, their own mentalities. But um, it, 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 if you look back to Piranese, he um, talks about the fact that, you know, architects shouldn't be uh, bound to either Greek or Roman architecture. And I think Soane and Gandhi would say not only Greek and Roman architecture, but also you can add into the mix um, Gothic architecture. Uh, and there, there was certainly an is interest in trying to find common denominators, uh, both in terms of religion, mythology, and uh, architectural designs across the board. And, and, and both of them were influenced by this uh, Frenchman, uh, the Baron Dunkerville, who um, developed these ideas in two influential books, one the catalog of William Hamilton's uh, Greek uh, vases and the other, the townly collection of uh, Greek sculpture um, in which he, 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 he put forward this idea that there was a common universal religion in antiquity. And, and many people in, in, 
in Britain were influenced by this, and, and, and certainly Sohn was, was among them. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, uh, I just wanted to add one other thing before we go to the questions. Did, um, did Sohn ever write anything about Gandhi that would make you think, that would give you us a little bit more of a sense of what he thought about him um, as a person or, or how much Gandhi uh, uh, helped Sohn uh, uh, achieve the image that he's famous for today? That, I mean, so much of it is due to Gandhi's paintings. Did, did, did Sohn ever talk about it or write about it? Or is it something he just rather preferred to ignore? You think? Well, uh, they they were both very complicated uh, people, and and both had uh, a sense of, uh, of 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 grievance, I suppose, with the with the world. But I think Sohn uh, felt that. Well, I suppose, like a number of other members of the Royal Academy, they felt that Gandhi was his own worst enemy because he was very, he could be very rude. He wasn't very um, compliant. If what patron wanted to change an idea, he would dig in his heels and things like that. So I think after a while, I mean, he, he did, uh, on the other hand, um, apprentice his own son, Johnson uh, Jr. to Gandhi when Gandhi set up for a while as an architect in uh, Liverpool. Uh, but it didn't really work out terribly well. And, um, but nonetheless, you know, because Sohn realized that although Gandhi perhaps put too much of his talent in these drawings and not in, in practical architecture or becoming a successful architect, he still could see that, you know, that he, he could use Gandhi. Uh, and I think that Gandhi also needed the money and uh, did a lot of this kind of work, topographical, uh, drawings which were published by this uh, a man named John Britton of um, churches and uh, yeah, antiquarian uh, lore. And, um, but, you know, he never really, I mean, he, he did have a, f publish a, create a few buildings, but they're really rather heavy or just slight, un uninspiring really. So I think it was, um, there was a sense of mutual convenience about it, but I, I, you can see, I think, in, if you look at the sketch for the um, architectural compositions, and then you look at the finished work, you can imagine Sohn and Gandhi, you know, Gandhi showing him the sketch and Sohn says, well, do this, do that, you know, move this around. So, uh, and, and someone like C.R. Leslie, in his quote about you know these drawings when Sohn was virtually blind with cataracts, um, you you again wonder where the balance is in the in the equation. I have to say, before this lecture, I was a little nervous, thinking, "Will Gandhi come off as the hero here? What about dear John Sohn?" And but really, what you you get a clear sense that that Sohn is the genius. That oh, yeah. all the invention comes from Sohn and all the ideas about simplifying details and, and creating this new kind of architecture based on what he remembered back then really comes from Sohn. And that Gandhi is a wonderful renderer that, that helped mm -hmm. enormously, but that, that Sohn was the genius. And that, yeah, I'm so glad true. that that's been clarified, frankly, for, <laughs> for, for all of our sakes. <laughs> yes, no, 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 no. I think, and also, you know, Sohn was a generation older, so. Gandhi had was was deferential towards him, and um, right. he was you know better trained, better educated. So yes, Michael, are there some questions we want to bring up from that uh, have been posed by the audience? There are, and you know they pull on some of the threads that we've already mm -hmm. seen established here. So so someone asked, did, did Gandhi design any buildings that were actually built? And to that, I would add um, that I've seen a pattern book from 1805 of rural buildings, mm -hmm. lodge gates, et cetera, designed by Gandhi. So, so cottages, we, cottages, cottages. Yeah. So, do we have any sense of whether anything was built? Oh yes, there were there were a, some buildings built in London, and uh, which one, one was a. Um, I think the Phoenix um, Life Assurance Company, um, there are photographs of these, perhaps I, I should have shown them, but they're really rather dull and they've been demolished. There's one gothic, gothicizing uh, law court in Liverpool, um, 
but again, you know, it's sort of over decorated. And I'd, I, I don't think he, as an architect, he was really that, that interesting. He had this gift for the, the for fantasy, uh, but it sort of ran away with him as with those, you know, royal palace designs that um, right. I showed you those recreations of, of ancient Greece. There's a sense that he didn't, he didn't have the clarity of thinking that John Stone had. He had some yeah. could focus on some ideas and make something out of them and really develop a new vocabulary that was consistent and that you can see now when you go see the museum. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I think Stone had much, uh, much clearer theory of architecture. Uh, and so, I mean, Gandhi is part of, this, of that stream, but um, Gandhi, I think, yes, there's a lack of clarity. You can see it in the way that um, things become over, de over designed, over, yeah, over decorated. Right, right. There, so there's a question, there are actually two that sort of touch on this question of the universal religion or the sort mm -hmm. of global mm -hmm. styles that you were sharing. And one of the questions from Jacqueline is, could, could Gandhi have seen, and perhaps we should add, could Sohn have seen, right? Since this is how we're thinking of them. The Napoleon drawings of, um, the, the Napoleon's expedition of around 1800 in Egypt. So that I think that's uh, a very famous uh, set mm -hmm. of drawings. We can assume that they did. And also, she wonders whether Gandhi knew British Indian architecture or architects of North India. So sort of like how far afield is, is yeah. this global influence beyond Egyptian? Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, certainly they were aware of uh, Egyptian uh, art uh, and architecture um, because it was already being published uh, around 1800 and then of course, people like Belzoni, who was an Italian adventurer and uh, amateur archaeologist, um, was supplying the British Museum with um, sculpture from Egypt. And, and that's where Sohn's uh, sarcophagus came from. It was Belzoni founded in the Valley of the Kings and um, exhibited it in London in a room which he painted to resemble the tomb chamber from the Valley of the Kings. Um, so that's um, certainly people were aware of, of Egyptian art, art and Egyptomania became, you know, through the, the Napoleon um, became very popular across Europe. Uh, as far as Indian, uh, yes, of course, you know, the, the Dutch, the uh, English, the French were all uh, involved in India in the second half of the 18th century. And um, an artist, a Royal Academician whom uh, Sohn knew in the 1790s and from whom he acquired two paintings, um, published, a, went on a, um, a tour uh, as part of the entourage of Warren Hastings, who was the governor of Bengal, and did a number of paintings which were exhibited in London and uh, Sohn bought two of them. And uh, I think about as early as 1794, 1795. And then uh, Hodges published a book about his travels in India and illustrated things like uh, columns and commented on the similarity between Indian columns and Greek columns and things like that. So, and in fact, if you look at, there's an illustration by uh, Hodges, which is, invites comparison with uh, Sohn's pasticcio. And of course, Sohn did have this capital, I don't know how he found it or how he acquired it, uh, which he thought was Hindu, but in fact actually comes, it's Moroccan. But uh, it, he puts it together with a Greek capital, or with a Roman capital to show this con con continuity across the ancient world. So he believed in this very much. And of course, as I said, uh, Dunkerville uh, was tremendously influential in spreading this idea that there was a, sort of a common ancient religion which was worshipped from China to uh, the Baltic. And um, Sohn and people like Payne Knight uh, believed and you know, subscribed to this idea. They were really sort of, um, it was a kind of agnosticism about Christianity. So people had to tread carefully, but, but Sohn wasn't really wasn't very religious um, and was skeptical about it. Uh, but, you know, someone like Blake, of course, was interested in this sort of thing. And Blake sincerely believes that the Laocoon had come from the Temple of Solomon. 
it's a, this is a wonderful seg to another question that's developed mm -hmm. in, the, in the realm of the romantic and the terrible poetic vision. Mm -hmm. um, someone asks, well, they, po they say Gandhi died in an asylum. Can you comment mm -hmm. on how Gandhi's presumed mental illness contributed to some of his more fantastical drawings? Um, do we have a sense <laughs> of, of just how fantastical his, uh, he was as a person? <laughs> In well, I, the, I think the fact that he found it difficult to hold down a job, uh, that he sort of gave up architecture and spent the latter part of his years writing a multi-volume uh, treatise, which was going to try to um, decode architectural signs, sort of like a semiotics of architecture, which was also going to link up with uh, religion, because, of course, in the ancient world um, architecture is, is very important for the manifestation of, of religion. Um, part of this survives, um, I haven't read it, but Brian Lukacher, whose who's book on Gandhi, which came out in 2006, uh, conveys very well this kind of, uh, really, you might say, cul-de-sac that he he falls into you know he just gets lost a bit like uh, Blake with some of these late mythological works that are very difficult to to try to disentangle um, so I think I think probably you can see the what happens to him uh, because of the nature of his personality and the fact that um, as I think you know one of his supporters in the Royal Academy was Constable, the uh, landscape painter Constable. And Constable, after one of these attempts to nominate uh, Gandhi for a full academician, uh, which is defeated, um, talks about it with um, I think it's Turner or another. No, it was Westmacott, who was a good friend of of Gandhi's, the sculptor Westmacott, and he said that you know the. Gandhi was just very rude, very difficult person and uh, not really um, able to get on with people and not able to get on with, with, with patrons, which really, you know, were, were hampered him in getting on in life. It sounds like he was always teetering a bit between being a kind of a genius and, and not being able to hold it together and maybe being yeah. insane. But, and then he finally just sort of fell over to the other side as maybe yeah. we all will someday. And um, <laughs> that's what it waits on us. But um, I, I, I don't think there's a clear line, that's for sure, between you know when somebody's a genius and when somebody becomes uh, unable to do anything and they yeah. become sort of insane. You know, Bruce, I just wanted to comment, I think it's fascinating you were talking about this idea of that everybody was interested in going back to an original religion and they were interested in origins of architecture. Because this is also the time when uh, the, the the sort of kind of the discovery of the idea of Indo-European languages came about. Yes, in yeah, the late eighteen yeah. hundreds or late seventeen hundreds by uh, uh, British who were stationed in India and noticed the, the similarities between Sanskrit and Greek and Roman. So this was it must yeah. have been a whole world uh, swirling around of everything going back to simple origins. Well, and, and also that that's. That's a very good point, Paul. And the other thing that uh, is in the mix is uh, comparative anatomy. Um, Sohn was very taken with the work of uh, Georges Cuvier, who was very important uh, scientific figure in the Napoleonic uh, world and uh, gave lectures about comparative anatomy. And this is where I think Sohn's interest in comparative archeology architecture comes from, and also with Gandhi, that somehow if you set it out, you can see find these connections, make the connections between work in China, work in uh, Greece, you know, work in India, all this sort of thing. And of course, you have uh, people began publishing books of comparative architecture around 1800 too, particularly in France. Um, I think it's uh, is it Durand, I think, who does this um, comparative work on, on, on architecture. So, I think you know there, the, there's this attempt to try to put the study of architecture on a on a more scientific basis, but at the same time there is this kind of rather crazy undercurrent of you know a, a key to all mythologies. You know if you think of 
something like Middlemarch by George Eliot, which is set in 1830, thereabouts. And Dorothea Brooks' husband, Cosabon, is trying to find a, a key to all mythologies. That's his great life work, you know. And this is something that comes out of the, an earlier generation of people like uh, Payne Knight and, um, and Donkerville. And Bruce, you and I were discussing the Adelphi, Robert Adams' uh, great building on the Strand that recalls Diocletian's palace in Split. And I was saying you know, he achieved this, the monumentality that you feel Sonin and Gandhi are wanting to achieve in some of those watercolors, right? The scale of public architecture that might have been seen in France but it doesn't have the same depth of texture that actually feels ancient. And you were, you were describing how Sohn sort of achieves an ancient atmosphere, an ancient uh, texture that sort of goes beyond these questions of scale or vocabulary, which I thought was a really important mm -hmm. point. You know, he's sort of channeling the ancient world in a more profound way. Well, I think un unfortunately for most uh, British architects in this period, uh, or even in, in, in the 18th century, um, because the crown was so weak and didn't really have the money that say uh, the Bourbons did or Napoleon, um, most great patronage seemed to, by default, go to magnets, uh, you know, like the Dukes of Devonshire or something like that. Uh, so therefore, you know, Buckingham Palace is really rather, I mean, it's, Nash is great in terms of laying out, you know, Regent's Park and things like that, but uh, it's it's not particularly inspired. It's a kind of pastiche architecture. Uh, and I think, too, to some degree, I mean, Soane Palace, if it had been built, would have been perhaps impressive, but I'm not sure that he had the right kind of sense of monumentality that, say, someone like Banborough did it at Blenheim. Certainly his... Um, he was a great admirer of, uh, of Van Bros and, um, and Robert Adam. He, he thought that they both uh, had movement in their architecture, which uh, was something that um, he felt a lot of contem his contemporary architecture lacked. There was much more, it was too staccato. I have to say, I'm uh, looking at some of some, those drawings and looking at what Nash did, I'm really pleased that Nash got the, the job, frankly. <laughs> I just think the best of Nash has a way of, in a way what Nash did and the way that it's fragmented in, in pieces, in a way it's like Stone's house on the scale of the city, whereas some <laughs> drawings were the, at this sort of taking uh, a, a houseman idea and making a palace out of it. I mean, it's so huge and vast and I, I just can't imagine what that building would have, would have been like. Anyway, just to talk about Something just more specific, Bruce. There, a lot of mm -hmm. these renderings were watercolors, but were any of them oils, or are they actually all watercolors? Well, I think I think he um, he did sub submit to the Royal Academy three watercolors, um, but mostly he worked in watercolor. Yeah, I'm sorry, three oils. He submitted right, three right. oils, mainly in in watercolor uh, or um, gouache, as did uh, Clarisso. And so much is, uh, very difficult to show yeah. any of them because you have to be so careful with watercolors. They they um, they fade so easily in light. That mm. would be a, a, a great challenge for the museum to keep these you know, these uh, images on view at the same time that they're being protected from uh, damaging UV light. It is it is a challenge, but we we do try to limit the uh, opening of uh, of those panels and. Um, in some cases, uh, in the picture room recess, we've had to take down uh, watercolors and um, to conserve them and we'll be putting up in their place um, facsimiles, just as we had to do with the Piranesi drawings of Pastum, which are in the um, picture room because they were um, in risk of, of being damaged by too much, too much light. It's, it's, it is a it is a problem because you don't want everything to be a facsimile, but at the same time you have to try to make sure that it's preserved for the next generation. Exactly. And On this the topic to remind line. everybody who's listening to us the extraordinary amount of work that goes into keeping all of this together, which is one of the things that you do, your staff does, and that we mm -hmm. work very hard to help you with. 
because in fact, all of it is really fragile. And it's a sort of visual opera that exists because you all are there making sure it does exist for the future. And um, uh, it, it, one can see pictures of it or the wonderful renderings uh, that Gandhi did, but there's nothing like going there and seeing the real thing and seeing every bit of art and sculpture that's sewn selected for, for that wonderful house and museum. Yes. And we're so, and, and you're just reopening, which is very exciting. Yes, we reopened uh, Wednesday um, of uh, yesterday, in fact. And uh, we, it, we still have social distancing and people have to wear masks, but um, it's been, the public has been enthusiastic. You have to have timed tickets, but they're free. And we also have a wonderful exhibition at the moment, which we just opened uh, called The Romance of Ruins, which um, commemorates a expedition to the Turkish coast of Ionia and to Athens by uh, a group of Nicholas Rivette and um, an artist named William Pars, uh, among others, to look at the, um, the land of Troy and the land of Homer's uh, Iliad, and then of course also the uh, Acropolis. And William Pars created a series of uh, 21 watercolors, um, which are among the earliest uh, views of uh, the Acropolis and also of some of the sculptures of the Acropolis, as well as the Temple of Apollo at Didyma and other um, uh, the Temple of Poseidon at Sunni and various other. And they're beautiful, uh, very evocative watercolors. And so that uh, they've been lent to us by the British Museum. Uh, and that will be on display uh, with us until the 5th of September. So all across the summer. That's wonderful. It's a good reason to get on British Airways and get over there as soon as we can. I don't know if as we can, can today, but uh, I think we'll be able to soon. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so and, much, Bruce. This is so, so wonderful. And and you're giving a lecture. Uh, you also are there is going to be a lecture on that uh, show, right? So, yeah. And so it's, we'll be posting links to both of the upcoming lectures in the chat so that as we close this uh, talk, hmm? our viewers will be able to sign up for the talks on the 26th and the June 1st, which you can queue up, Bruce, if you like. Well, we're having a, a talk um, with, um, I'm having a talk with Susan Stewart, who's university professor at Princeton, who's written a, a brilliant new book called The Ruin Lesson. And we'll be talking about that next Wednesday at the same time, um, 1, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time, uh, where you are. And then on the, I think it's the 1st of June, Roy, Rory Stewart, another Stewart, uh, who's a former MP and also, um, has walked through this area of uh, Turkey and the Middle East, uh, is going to talk about uh, his experience of, of doing a latter-day version of this kind of expedition. Um, so I think they'll both be uh, great fun. And um, I hope, you know, those of you who can will, will uh, listen in and uh, watch. Uh, and also, I just wanted to, to say you know, thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you virtually and and again thank you to the foundation and uh, your patrons for the long-standing support that uh, you've given to the museum uh, in so many ways uh, you help us bridge the gap between what we do and what we want to do thank you bruce it's always a pleasure uh, and so uh, we are I'm, i know i'm going to tune into those lectures they sound wonderful um I just want to uh, uh, thank our audience for joining us and uh, to wish you all a wonderful summer. And, uh, but do look up occasionally from your beach towel and check out our website because we're going to be updating you over the summer on our next lecture series for the next season. Uh, it starts in the fall. The, uh, the theme of that lecture series is going to be, um, why am I blanking on it right now? Rule and Invention. Yes, rule and invention. It should be very memorable. It is. Uh, <laughs> rule and invention. And in fact, we have a lot of the, the lectures already lined up. And it's going to be wonderful. I think it's going to be a, a great. And, and we're going to have Bruce back to talk about that, which when uh, when uh, Sohn is a perfect person to talk about and the museum is a perfect per, uh, building to talk about when thinking about the ideas of rule and invention. So thank you all for joining us. And Bruce, thank you so much. For, uh, Thank you. Uh, the adventure you just